let's open the book and, as it were, look at its structure. Uh, it's, it, it comprises three parts. The first part is called Skeptics, and there you will find, as it were, some prominent case studies um, about people who have been nominated as alternative uh, writers of the Shakespeare canon, whatever we might mean by that word canon in that context. So um, Graham Holderness gets the ball rolling, as it were, with the person who got the ball rolling, Delia Bacon, in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and then that the case for Sir Francis Bacon is taken up by Alan Stewart, the case of Christopher Marlowe by Charles Nicholl, and the Earl of Oxford, who his name is missing, um, Alan Nelson wrote the chapter on Oxford. He really did write the chapter on Oxford, which is <laughs> not disputed. And the unusual suspects by Matt Cubus, Cubus. Uh, more on that in a moment. But uh, Stanley, these these are uh, prominent um, authorities on these writers. Yes, they are. Yes, uh, Graham has written a very interesting piece about Delia Bacon, a much reliant lady, uh, who was a, a, a distinguished woman uh, uh, in in her own right, a good teacher, even though she went on to uh, take up very unorthodox views. And, uh, and Graham's piece is a very interesting re-examination. She always talked about as being unreadable, and Graham is one of the few people who have actually read the unreadable, the unreadable book and philosophy of Shakespeare's plays. The other, um, she was interested in collaborative authorship, wasn't she? Yes. Um, and in, in some ways, Ros, I mean, you're sort of perhaps a modern day Delia Bacon yourself. No, I would think yeah. that's not at all fair. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You look nothing like her. <laughs> no, and uh, I think we have very different backgrounds. I mean, for a start, she was self-taught, as I believe, because as a woman, she couldn't, which is it's, it's very she's interesting. Questioning. She's she was questioning, yeah, but <laughs> plenty of plenty of people um, have questions, and not just not just Delia Bacon, obviously, but she was the first person to put it out there. But you know, yeah, she was she was self-taught, whereas I've course have done a. And I in a PhD. Um, I, so I, I, was I was making a comparison mainly to do with the fact that both of you have. Um, Some inquiring minds, and inquiring minds, yeah. And, and actually, the collaborative authorship, she was ahead of the game as well as being the first yeah, one to get the ball rolling. Holder was very interesting. Uh, Absolutely. And you see, collaborative authorship, although it was beginning to be acknowledged in, yes, in Shakespeare was. studies during her same, period. Exactly the same time, actually. Yeah. The, the first theories about Fletcher was handed in Henry VIII, for example, is come to the same name. But the sense in which um, collaboration is something which has, has grown within Shakespeare studies very importantly it, in the last 30 years. Yes, th th this absolutely. is in, in some ways, Stan, well, you have been at the forefront of this. Yes, I've been with the Oxford Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. with the Oxford Shakespeare, which I've enjoyed. Yeah, I do actually have an issue with the word collaborative because I'm very interested in words, and I do have an issue with the word collaborative because I, I think of it very much as co authorship. I know that Brian mm. Vickers' work is Shakespeare co author, and I think that co authorship can take a number of different forms. Yes, collaboration suggests all sitting around the table doing something at the same time, whereas I think co authorship gives much more possibilities for a partial manuscript being finished by someone mm. else, or you know, someone gets the beginning, someone gets the end. And I, and especially because you tend to see co authorship in the Shakespeare canon at the beginning and the end of the canon much mm. more than in the middle. Yes. I, I, I much prefer the term co-authorship, I think is a bit more correct than collaboration, because mm. collaboration is yeah, too suggestive of, yeah. of things that may not have occurred, if you like. So. Yes. Well, her style is difficult to read. There's an example of that just, just looming. But just to just reflect briefly on the cultural moment in which she appeared, uh, detective fiction was on the rise. Uh, ten years earlier, um, Charles Darwin had published Origin of Species, in which he'd removed one absolutely unquestioned theory of the start of the universe, the the, the, the Christian and Judaic narrative of the origins of the world, and, and put in some, an, an alternative theory. And then 10 years later, what do you know, something similar is being done with the authorship of Shakespeare's plays. I find that highly interesting and possibly the reason why uh, this phenomenon didn't start until the middle of the 19th century. Yeah, I think it's part of the reason. Yeah, part of the reason. Yeah. Um, now, this is an example of what Graham Holderness cites in his chapter as an area of, uh, of her unreadability. And this is why she's little read today. It's a very difficult style. The brave, bold genius of Raleigh flashed new life into that little nucleus of the Elizabethan development. The new round table, which that newly beginning age of chivalry with its new weapons and devices and its new and more heroic adventure had created was not yet full till he came in. The round table grew rounder with this knight's presence. 
over those dainty stores of the classic ages, over those quaint memorials of the elder chivalry that were spread out on it, over the dead letter of the past, the brave Atlantic breeze came in, the breath of the great future blew, when the turn came for this night's adventure, whether opened in the prose of its statistics or set to its native music in the mystic melodies of the bard who was there to sing it. I was fine until I got the Atlantic breeze, <laughs> and then just slightly after after night's adventure, yeah. I sort of lost my lost yeah. 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 Lost. She's, well, She really desperately needs an editor, I have to say. <laughs> I, I was having problems with the yeah. newly and new and the new. You know? um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's not a great writer, is she? But and, an innovator. But, yeah. it, and it's, but it's very fictive as well, and mm, I think the it approach is, is I'm yeah. like, it's interesting to me that the first person to put the Marlowe argument mm. forward put it forward in a novel. Yes. Um, yes. But this is, this is, you know, very imaginative writing. It is, and yeah. it alludes self-consciously to myth, to myth mm. doesn't it, Arthurian especially. Mm. Uh, and I love that cultural um, clash between the American and the British, the Atlantic breeze coming in, <laughs> that's very, very interesting. The Atlantic breeze is Delia Baker. <laughs> <laughs> she is the Atlantic mm. breeze. Now, so, but anyway, the, the what what arises pretty quickly after after she gets the ball rolling within the, the next sort of seventy years or so is a sort of whodunit scenario, whereby it, it's beginning to seem that anybody apart from Shakespeare Stratford is is a reasonable suspect. Um, so there we have uh, an image of, of a man who might be Christopher Marlowe. Yes, no, that's no a certainty about that. Putative portrait. Yes. Um, the uh, Francis Bacon and great and, writer. Great writer. And the, <laughs> and the Earl of Oxford, and there we, we think of the three, as it were, prominent nominees. Those are the three most prominent currently, yes. But there are many others. Some of the other people have been mentioned are Roger Manners, the Earl of Rutland, Daniel Defoe, mm. an interesting one, yes. Sir Henry Neville, William Stanley, Sixth Earl of Derby, Elizabeth I herself. She crops up in a lot of the narratives about this. Mm. Sir Walter Raleigh, Lady Mary Sidney, the will for it to be. Uh, a female nominee has also just come up in recent years. That yeah, one, yeah. Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, even Ben Johnson has been suggested. <laughs> now, in in our book, there is a chapter by Matt Cubis, which sort of mops up at the last count 77 other nominees, in which he says mathematically, each time an additional candidate is suggested, the probability decreases that any given name. Is a true author. I want to query that because I want to know is that mathematically true? I and mean, do we have any mathematicians listening into the webcast who could actually tell me whether that's a true statement or not? Mathematicians, we need you <laughs> at this point. Send a tweet to Stratford. It, it looks to me on. like an assertion uh, rather than something that is necessarily mathematically true. But my maths only went to A level, so what do I know? Well, whenever we, whenever we hit probability, I, I always imagine large bars of chocolate and fractions <laughs> and so on. But it seems to me that, as I understand the maths, there, it's about the more. That there, the more uh, named possibilities that there are, the less a share of chocolate that they'll receive. But, but you see, does it really work like that? Because do we not agree that there is someone who is at least the central author of the works of Shakespeare, even if there are other hands involved, that there is a true author? So, I mean, if this was mathematically true, surely that would decrease, you know, Shakespeare of Stratford's probability of being the true author as much as it is saying, you know, any given name is the true author. And that would include all the names. So I, I dispute that as a, as a point of maths. I think that it sounds clever, but probably isn't true. 